there's some strange irony about being here in the Galapagos. Come to this uh, research center, and there's a sign out here, and it speaks to our level of adaptability <laughs> and just how weak we are. The Galapagos Islands are the birthplace of the theory of evolution. This natural wonder famously inspired by Charles Darwin to track how finches adapt to survive. Adam Yamaguchi traveled to the archipelago to see how climate change is impacting the survival of the fittest. I spoke to Adam about his experience there. So Adam, tell me about the significance of the Galapagos. Why did you decide to go there and do this? So one of the primary reasons we decided to go to the Galapagos is that it is one of those rare, largely pristine environments where you can really look at animals and, and look at the effects that changes in the climate are having on their ability to adapt. And, and what I mean by that was, you know, here is a land that essentially inspired Charles Darwin to theorize evolution. Mm -hmm. This idea that animals will adapt in order to survive based on the environmental and climactic ecosystems that they, that they thrive in. And what we're seeing today is that as climate change accelerates the rate of adaptation, animals are, f are being forced essentially by the accelerating rate of climate change to adapt faster. When you talk about the adaption and making it faster, can you give us an example of an animal or species that you saw that really right. was impacted by climate change? So, so one is, is the, the finches that we, that we profiled in the piece. This is a, a remarkable animal that can adapt every, every generation. That is every year. You can see changes in their physiology that are meant to allow them to survive in the changing environment year after year after year. So with every successive generation, you've got birds that are somehow slightly different from the previous generation, suited, adapted to, 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 to survive and thrive in this new world. Now there are lots of other animals that aren't quite able to, to do that so quickly. Mm -hmm. um, penguins, for example, took millions of years in this in today's climate as, as the rate of, of climate change accelerates, do they, have, do they have millions of years? That's the big question and that's the big fear. Can they adapt fast enough? And, and the answer is probably not. But all throughout the Galapagos, I mean, it's this wonderland of wildlife where you get to see and really think about how each and, the, each and every one of these animals is somehow physiologically shaped or designed to be able to, to, to live and thrive in that particular environment. Did it change the way you think sort of about animal conservation and the environment by physically being at an inspiring place like the Galapagos? You know, yes. I mean, when you see these adorable penguins, yeah. all of these wonderful animals, you, we're emotional beings. We, we look at these animals and, and, we, and we feel a need to protect them and, and to provide, provide the environment for them to survive and thrive. And certainly human activity has, has played a hand in, in changing those ecosystems that are threatening many of these animals. We bear some responsibility and we feel a lot of responsibility. Mm -hmm. But the other side of that, and, and, and one of my big takeaways from this piece was when you, when you look at these animals and you think about the fact that these are all products of climate that has changed over the eons that we had nothing to do with. And they are what they are because of these natural processes. You start to think, if I didn't have this emotional attachment to these animals, then maybe this is just, this is just mother nature moving on. Mm -hmm. And it's a savage, savage process. Yeah. But it is, it is essentially, it takes us back to the theory of evolution. You know, Survival of the fittest. Exactly. And, and, I'll, and I'll point out one example. I mean, the polar bear is the poster child of climate change. Mm -hmm. Polar bear is a product of climate change. Many, many, many thousands of years ago, when, when, when brown bears migrated northward, in a time when the climate was cold, and somehow adapted a white coat, adapted its ability to feed and live off the ice and, mm. and icy waters. We had no, no part in that. That was a natural rhythm. And that animal was birthed out of that environment. So when you, when you sort of step back take off that emotional attachment, you realize that on some levels, yes, we are fully responsible for what is happening today. We've, we've, we've thrown a wrench into a system, we've accelerated climate change, and mm -hmm. it's forcing these animals to adapt faster. However, things would be changing, and the animals would be figuring out a way anyway. Mm -hmm. 
What I find so remarkable when you look at the vivid videography of being out there, just this untouched land that's been untouched for thousands of years, now there's this push for tourism in this area. Has that impacted this untouched land? It has, it has had a, a, a pretty sizable impact in certain parts of the Galapagos. So the Galapagos is an ar archipelago of over a hundred islands and islets. And, and humans are largely clustered in, in only about two or three of the islands. That's where all the tourists go. The Ecuadorian government has done a remarkable job in maintaining the pristine nature of most of the islands. A lot of the places that we went to are highly, highly regulated and restricted. We, we got to see places that really see no visitors except for the scientists who are charged with researching the, the animals there. Mm -hmm. So for the most part, they are largely free of sort of localized impacts. Mm -hmm. But you do see the impact, and I'll give you one example. I'll go back to the finches. Again, they show this remarkable ability to adapt. But if you go and look at the finches in those heavily populated areas, what you'll find is that their beak has actually, in some ways, devolved. Devolved. So these birds feed off of hard, hard seeds, nuts, and whatnot. Well, the birds that are near human populations, near where people eat and dine and throw scraps of food, yeah. bread and yeah. other soft food, well, their beak actually can no longer penetrate these seeds. They have to have softened human foods that are, that are sort of somewhat, you know, somewhat able to eat the things that we do. And you've seen these physical, physiological changes. Can that bird then go back, fly back to one of the islands that isn't populated? Would it find any food? Probably not. So there is a very localized human impact. Um, and it's, you know, I mean, it's, it's everywhere. Everywhere there are clusters of humans, there is an impact. It's a fascinating report and a look at the Galapagos. Adam Yamaguchi, thank you for bringing this to us.